Hello and welcome back to Algebra, the video course where we talk a lot about groups, rings and vector spaces. And in today's part 6 we will talk about the so-called cancellation property of groups. So we are still in the topic of group theory and we can do some general proofs there. However, before we start with that, you already know, first I want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. So please check the link in the description to see how you can support me and which additional material you can download. And with that I would say we can immediately start by recalling that a semigroup is simply a pair consisting of a set S and a binary operation on it. And now in order to keep it simple, often we will not use the name for the binary operation, we will just put two elements next to each other. So you know this is a common short notation if the binary operation is a multiplication. However here we could have any semigroup, so this notation is just there to keep the formulas short. Ok, and now please recall from the last videos that a semigroup becomes a group if two things are there. On the one hand we need an identity element and on the other hand all elements need to have inverses. And now exactly these inverses make groups very nice to work with because it means we can solve a lot of equations in it. And this I want to immediately state as a fact and I can already tell you this will be the cancellation property. So we can take a general group and let's call it G. And moreover I want to take four elements from the group. And let's call them A, B, X and Y. And then we are able to solve the following two equations. So first I start with AX is equal to AY. And then the conclusion is that we can cancel the a on the left such that x is equal to y. So this is what we would call the left cancellation property. So you see we can simply cancel elements on the left. And now in a similar way we can also consider the equation with b from the right hand side. And then the result is the same because we can cancel the b from the right, so we get x is equal to y as well. So this is the right cancellation property and as you can see it works in every group. Indeed you might already see the proof, but for the sake of completeness I want to write it down. But still I think it's sufficient to write down only one of the two implications. So let's take the second one and let's use our neutral element in g. This means any x can be written as x times the identity e. And now we can use the fact that in g all inverses exist. So in particular e can be written as b times b inverse. This holds for any b in g and now we can use the associativity. Which simply tells us that we can put the parentheses here. And then we can use our assumption namely xb is equal to yb. And then you see we can use the associativity again. In other words here we have b times b inverse which is e again, namely we get out y on the right. And there you see that's it, this proves the right cancellation property here. And I already told you the proof of the left cancellation property works exactly the same just from the other side. So the conclusion here is since the inverses exist we can multiply with them and cancel the element. So if someone tells you something about cancellation properties in groups, they mean these two implications. And now what we will show in this video is that the two cancellation properties already define the whole group. But before we can do that, I first have to tell you about a definition we use for semigroups. In fact, you already know if we say semigroup, we also include all possible groups as well. This is just a reminder because often we will say we have the order of a group. However, the notion order also makes sense for semigroups. And indeed it's not complicated at all, it's just the number of elements in our set S. And the common notation we have is to shorten order and just write odd of S. However, this symbol here is mostly only useful if we have finitely many elements. 
So in that case, one can just write that we have the cardinality of the set S. And for this, usually people use the vertical bars here or they use this number symbol. So it's the cardinality of the set S which counts the number of elements in it. And this is really simple if S is a finite set. And in the other case that the set is not finite, ORT of S should simply represent the symbol infinity. So there we don't go into the details of the cardinality, we simply write the infinity symbol. And as you remember, in the last video we have already discussed examples for finite groups, but also examples where the order is infinity. And I can already tell you, we will look at some more examples very soon. However, first I want to show you that you can check if a semigroup is a group, even if you don't know the neutral element. I call it lemma because we will use that for the main result of this video. So here we just start with a general semigroup, which means we don't need to have a neutral element. Still, we know that we need one if we want to have a group. And it turns out that there is an equivalent formulation where no neutral element is stated. In fact, it's already related to our cancellation property because it tells us that we can solve some equations. More concretely, we can say that for two given elements A and B, we find two solutions for equations and we call these elements X and Y. And moreover, the two equations should have A on the left hand side and B on the right hand side. So more precisely, we can write a together with x is equal to b and y times a should also be equal to b. So please note b is not the neutral element, so we are not talking about left inverses and right inverses, but you already see it's very similar. Therefore I would say let's try to write down the proof. And here we have an equivalence, which means we have to prove two implications. And I would say let's start with the easy one, let's go from left to right. So we already assume that S is a group. And then the question is simply for given A and B, what is our X and Y? And this is not complicated at all because we already have inverses we can work with. So for example, X is simply A inverse times B. This is a well-defined element and if we put it in, we see it satisfies this equation. And in a similar way, y should be given as b times a inverse. There we also see the equation is satisfied and we are done with this implication. Hence the actually interesting implication is obviously the other one. There we now have to find the identity element e and all inverses. And the only two things we can use is first that we have a semigroup and second that for all a, b we have this property. So in particular we also have this property if a is equal to b. Therefore also in this case we find two elements x and y with the property that a x is equal to a and y a is also equal to a. In other words, now we already have two candidates for our neutral element. Therefore, let's pick the y element and let's call it e. In other words, now we have e times a is equal to a. This looks very good for a left neutral element. However, the problem is it only works for our given a here. Therefore, the immediate question is, can we extend this property to any other element as well? Hence, in the next step, let's take an arbitrary element b as well. And then we know from our property, which is our assumption, that for our given a and b, we find an element x such that this equation is satisfied. And to avoid some confusion, maybe let's call this element x tilde. So we get a times x tilde is equal to our element b. And now we can simply combine both things we have here. In other words, now we can simply calculate e times b. And then in the first step, we can represent our b by a times x tilde. And then as always, we can simply apply our associativity. 
which tells us now it's possible to use our first equation here. So we simply have a here. So more precisely, we have a times x tilde, and there we already know this is simply equal to b. So by reading the equation from left to right, we see that E is our left neutral element. So it's a left identity simply because B is arbitrarily given, so it works for every B in S. And moreover, now we also know that we find a left inverse for such an arbitrary B. We see that because we can use our property from before, just instead of A, we now choose E. And this implies that we have an element we can call y tilde, such that y tilde times b is equal to e. So you see, the property we put in is really strong. This is because it has to work for every two elements we put in. So the conclusion is, if you see this equation, with respect to our left neutral element, b is left invertible. And again, this works no matter what b is, so it works for every b in s. So we have that all elements in S are left invertible, and there you know, this is sufficient for having a group. In fact, we have discussed that in part 4, if we have the things from the left, we also have them from the right, so we have a group. And there we have it, we have shown that S is a group, and the whole lemma is proven. Okay, and now as stated at the beginning, we can use these facts and connect them to the cancellation properties. Therefore, the following proposition will be the main result of this video. And what we need here is just a semigroup, but it has to be of finite order. So symbolically, we can simply write odd of s is less than infinity. And now we know this means our semigroup only has finitely many elements in it. And such a semigroup is an actual group if and only if both cancellation properties are satisfied. So you know we have the left cancellation property and the right cancellation property and both are satisfied in a group. However, now the claim here is that this also works the other way around. This means if we have these two implications for all elements in the semigroup, it implies that we have an identity element and all the inverses as well. This is not clear at all, so I would say we also should write down a proof for it. And you already see, what we should use here is that we work in finite sets. And this tells us something about maps, because any map from S to S has a nice property. Namely, injectivity and surjectivity mean the same thing. So F is injective if and only if F is surjective. Indeed, this is simply a proof by induction and not hard to show for finite sets. The key element here is that we have the same number of elements on the left hand side as on the right hand side. So for example, for a subjective map, you want to hit all the elements on the right hand side. And then by counting, it's not possible that you hit one element twice on the right hand side. Of course, you can do the whole thing more formally, but it should be already clear that we have this statement for finite sets S. And therefore, now we can work with two maps that capture the idea of the cancellation property. Or to say it more precisely, for a given A, we will write A times X as a map. So let's call this map F with index A. And similarly, I also want to have a map G with index A. So both are defined from S to S, and let's call the input in the domain simply X. And as already mentioned, FA of X should be given as A times X. In other words, the binary operation is now given as a map FA. And exactly in the same way, it's also given as a map GA. But there, A now comes from the right hand side. Hence, in summary, you should see FA here is for our left cancellation property and GA for our right cancellation property. Therefore, what we want to do is to reformulate them with the two maps. So we can say the statement that both cancellation properties hold is equivalent for our formulation with the two maps. Namely, we have no matter what A is, if FA of X is equal to FA of Y, 
then this implies that x is equal to y. So it's exactly the left cancellation property just written with the map fa. And exactly in the same way, we can rewrite the right cancellation property with the map ga. And now the nice thing is, if you see these two implications, you recognize the injectivity of both maps. So the first implication means that fa is injective, and the second that ga is injective. And now we can use that this is equivalent for fa and ga being subjective. And in fact, this is the key step, because it tells us that every element on the right hand side here is hit. So if you take an arbitrary element b here, you find pre-images on the left hand side. So in words we could just say, for every b here on the right hand side, we find x and y on the left hand side that are sent to b. And there let's use x for fa and y for ga. So more concretely, g of y should be equal to b. And now we can just put in the definition of fa and ga, and then we have our result. So first we have ax is equal to b, and y times a is equal to b as well. And the important part here is that these two equations hold no matter what a and no matter what b is. Indeed, we have for every a and b, we find x and y with these two properties. So you should recognize this is exactly our lemma from before. And as you might remember, the lemma tells us that this is actually equivalent for s being a group. And with that we have it, we have proven that for a finite semigroup, the cancellation properties already define a whole group. So it is not possible to have a finite semigroup with the cancellation properties, which is not also a group. Hence you see this is a nice result and definitely something you should remember. And with that I would say let's continue our discussion of groups with the next videos. So I really hope we meet there again and have a nice day. Bye bye. Thank you.